Hi, friends. Welcome back to Money Girl, a podcast that helps you master your money so you can live rich and love the journey. I'm Laura Adams, a personal finance expert and author based in Silicon Valley. You can learn more about me at lauradadams.com. Since tax day is right around the corner, I wanted to bring you tips and advice from some unique tax professionals. In this show, I interview Garrett and Deborah Gregory. They have the same last name because they're a husband and wife team who founded the Gregory Law Group in Dallas, Texas. You'll hear their story in the interview, but before they started their firm, they worked for the IRS for more than 24 years combined. So they've got incredible in-depth knowledge and experience when it comes to tax law and helping people get and stay out of trouble with the IRS. Garrett couldn't stay on for the entire interview, so you'll just hear him at the beginning of our conversation. Here are some of the topics we cover. What consumers don't know but should about the IRS. What to do when you have a tax bill that you can't afford to pay. Whether claiming the home office deduction makes you more likely to be audited. How to get a handle on taxes when you have 1099 income how to stay organized so taxes are easier to prepare, and strategies for the average person to legally pay less tax and save more money. As always, you'll find notes from this show in the Money Girl section at quickanddirtytips.com. That's also where you'll find the full archive of podcasts that predate what's available in iTunes or any other audio app that you may be using. So here's the interview. So, Garrett and Deborah Gregory, I'm really pleased to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. You guys have a really unique background. Just summarize for me your experience in the tax world. Um, Well, we started, uh, well, by going to law school, we knew we we wanted to be a tax attorney. At least I did. Uh, And and Deborah came to to learn that as well through law school, and that's where, where we met. And then our first jobs, uh, well, first we got a, after law school, we got a Master of Laws in Tax. It was really just a year of specializing, drilling down into, into deeper tax courses. And then our first job was with PricewaterhouseCoopers in uh, Silicon Valley. And then uh, after that, we went to inside the government for each about 12 and a half years. Started off in Washington, D.C. Uh, as uh, attorneys with the IRS. I was in the national office. Deborah was in the field office there in Washington, D.C., And then after having our first child, we decided to come a little bit uh, closer to home back in Texas, where we're originally from. So we transferred down to the Dallas field office uh, of the IRS, where we finished out our IRS career. And uh, at that point, kind of determined we could uh, do the world a little bit uh, better good outside the service than inside the service. So we started our own firm, uh, Gregory Law Group, which has now been going for, oh gosh, two and a half coming up on three years uh, that that it's been uh, in existence. With so much experience, both in the private sector and also in the public sector, I'm very curious to hear what you think the average person doesn't know about the IRS, but should know. I'm sure there's a lot, but if there were a few things the average consumer should know, what would they be? Well, you know, what we see a lot is, and what we felt ourselves, the IRS doesn't care about you. I mean, that's, that's just the bottom line. You're a number to them. You're a file. We get a lot of clients that come in and, you know, they're very, sometimes very sad stories, things that happen. Well, you know, and, and they sort of say, well, can we just tell the IRS, you know, I had this happen to me or something. And most of the time, really, the IRS just doesn't care. It's, it's numbers driven. It's file driven. You know, you have to, it really is to your advantage when you're working with the IRS to either know yourself or have someone working on your behalf that understands how the IRS thinks. I mean, that's really critical. Everybody in the IRS is overworked. They're working on a 2008 budget. They've got way too many cases. So, you know, part of our strategy is, hey, IRS, let us help you get rid of this case, (laughs) you know, and it's always tinted in our client's favor, of course. But, you know, we want to do your work for you to make this a really easy case closure, okay? And we come at it from that uh, rather than being obstinate or being a roadblock. You know, that's, that kind of makes our firm, I think, a little bit different than what a lot of law firms do, which is jump up and down and scream and yell and, and, and try to get in the way. I mean, sometimes that's appropriate. But for the most part, it's, hey, let's help, help us do your job for you to make this really easy. 
let's say someone is listening who is finishing taxes or will finish taxes uh, within the next few weeks and finds out, uh uh-oh, I owe some money to the IRS. Maybe they uh, did not have enough withheld at work, or maybe they've got a side hustle. Maybe they've got extra income coming in from work that they're doing part-time, starting to freelance, doing contract work, that kind of thing, and they haven't put away enough for taxes. Now they've got a tax bill that they truly cannot afford to pay. What should they do immediately right off the bat to make sure that they are are getting as little penalty as possible and, and staying out of trouble? That's the story we hear almost daily, <laughs> you know, at least weekly here. Uh, well, the first thing to do, and, and what is against the grain. What a lot of people do is kind of stick their head in the sand. They kind of panic and they don't file. They think, ooh, I need to stay off the radar. That's the worst thing you can do. The best thing to do is file. Okay, absolutely file return, even if it's going to show you owe and you cannot pay. And the main reason for that is by not filing, you get hit with a 25% failure to file penalty. Okay, that's 25% of the tax that's owed that's not paid. Okay. And so, and that accrues very quickly. It accrues at a rate of 5% a month for five months till it caps at 25. So you're, you potentially, by not filing, you're just making a bad problem a whole lot worse. Okay. Um, so it's, it's best to absolutely file. And if you can pay anything, pay it. Or if you can start paying anything, just send in what you can. And as more money comes in, send it in to kind of ratchet that, that amount due down because any amount you owe and don't pay, you're also going to get hit with a 25% failure to pay penalty. Now, the failure to pay penalty isn't as bad because it accrues much slower. Rate right? of half a percent a month for 50 months, that's 5 until it caps at 25%. So you're better off filing and then chipping away at what you owe. Yeah, that's a really important distinction, failure to file and failure to pay. A lot of people don't realize uh, that they're, they're two different things and treated separately. So that's, that's, that's so important. You've got to file no matter what. Make sure you get that paperwork in by the deadline. Right. And, then, and, and also, depending on how much you, I mean, if it's a little amount, if we're talking a couple thousand bucks that you think, oh, I'll be able to you know, get on top of this in a few months, that's one thing. But if it starts getting over ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, then you need to call us or someone like us to, because you need to start positioning yourself for strategies once that tax, you know, the return gets processed, the tax gets assessed, and you're going to start getting those lovely letters from the IRS. The earlier someone like us gets you upstream in the process, the more options we have and the more ability we have to, to get you a better result that you can, you know, be a little bit more comfortable for you. As more and more people begin to work from home, either for a company or for themselves, doing contract work, there are a lot more opportunities for folks to take a home office deduction where it's qualified, where it's allowed. I think many people are afraid to do it. We've often heard that home office deductions are a red flag to the IRS and may cause an audit to happen. Do you think that's true? And if people are not claiming the home office deduction, what should they be thinking about to capture that tax savings? Well, I mean, yes. To to go back to the interview question, yeah, well, it absolutely was a red flag. I think there's no question. It, uh, It definitely, you know, raised your, your chances of being audited, and it was an area the IRS looked closely at. So much so, I think the IRS really got tired of spending the resources and looking at all that. So they came up with, starting in 2013, the simplified option, which, which basically is a, is a safe harbor. And that kind of does everybody a world of good. It's good for taxpayers because it, you know, you, it's much simpler to calculate. It's good for the IRS because as long as you sort of come within their safe harbor parameters, they're not going to mess with you, okay? They can kind of move on to bigger and better things. And, you know, it's, it, you can still choose to do the regular method, which is what people have done, done forever. You know, count out how many square feet you, you have and, and, you know, uh, figure out the ratio of that and then try to deduct, the, you know, your, your home mortgage interest and, you know, utilities and all that kind of stuff. The simplified method just says we're going to give you five bucks per square foot up to 300 square feet. Now the qualifying standards stay the same. You still have to show that you use this area of your house exclusively and regularly for business. Okay, you can't just pick out the dining room. It's gotta be a separate bedroom that's used for your office or an office or you know, whatever you have going on. 
Um, but as long as you meet those criteria up to 300 feet, and it, you know, they don't give you 300 feet, it has to be 300 feet or greater of space you're actually using, you get that $5 per square foot, and you still get to keep all of your Schedule A deductions. So you don't have to carve out any of the you know, utilities or home mortgage interest or anything like that. So it's really nice and simple from the IRS's perspective and for your, your, you know, you, the taxpayer's perspective. And then, like, later on, if you go to sell your home, you don't have to carve out any amounts that you, you know, depreciated or things like that. You just treat it as truly an expense rather than, you know, kind of a, you know, what you would do in a normal office if you had a standalone office and you're taking depreciation and things like that. So it, it really does simplify it for, for the taxpayer. Deborah, tell me about the best ways that the average consumer can stay organized so that their taxes are just easier and faster to prepare each year. One thing that we see a lot is, especially small business owners, that they don't have really good books and records. I think that's in large part because small business owners wear too many hats in their business. And the first thing that goes you know, to the wayside is bookkeeping. So an easy way for a small business owner or even just the average, you know, taxpayer to get organized is just to get a binder, get some folders in there, get 12 folders in there, um, sort it by month, and then just put the receipts in the folders as the year goes on. And then that way, at the end of the year, you have all your receipts in the same place, and it's very easy to get your figures ready for the return. I mean, you don't have to get exotic to get organized. You can go low-tech. And I just think that's an easy way for people to get organized, keep everything in one place, so that makes it really easy for them to prepare their return either themselves or to give it over to a tax return preparer. If you're just starting out in freelance or contract work with 1099 income, what's the best way to get a handle on how much tax you'll owe? Uh, That's a good question because we see that a lot. Um, you know, I think it's best to make estimated tax payments whenever you, you know, get the income from, from the, you know, the second source of income that you're taking in. At least do it on a quarterly basis. Don't wait until the end to, to make estimated tax payments. I think when you start your uh, second source of income business, you need to think about what legal structure you want to operate your business because this will impact how you're taxed. And, you know, if you're a sole prop and you get received a 1099, you're going to be taxed at ordinary rates. You need to make estimated tax payments. So you might want to consider setting up a corporation, becoming an employee, let the company pay the tax, you know, out of a W-2. You can also take ordinary necessary business expenses to the corporation. You know, for example, a business use of a car or meals and entertainment up to 50%. And if you had to give the average consumer three tips to cut their taxes, what are some really basic strategies that folks can use? You know, a common question I get is, wow, my, my income has gone up. Maybe I got a bonus or uh, we've gotten a, I've gotten a promotion. My income is going up. How do I manage the increase in taxes? It, it really takes a lot of people by surprise. So what are basic ways to cut them? You know, there are a couple of strategies that you can do to, that will help reduce your taxable income. For example, um, you can contribute to your 401k. So by contributing to your 401k, you're reducing your taxable income and your saving for retirement, which is a good thing. You can also contribute to the flexible spending account for medical expenses, for qualifying medical expenses. And again, by doing this, you're reducing your taxable income. Um, You can also contribute to a college tax savings of like a 529 plan. And all of this is just, it reduces your taxable income. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many opportunities out there for consumers to save money and save taxes at the same time. The college plans, retirement plans are really just a no-brainer. You know, if you've got uh, any type of extra income, I-, I feel like maximizing your 401k is really the best way to go. And if you're at an employer that doesn't offer that, look at an IRA, you know, look at other plans for the self-employed like a SEP IRA a solo 401k. There are a lot of options out there uh, that folks can investigate. Absolutely. When is the right time to turn to a professional for tax planning help? First of all, if you're starting a business, you really need to start thinking about taxes. A lot of folks just kind of 
starts a business and they don't think about the ramifications of the, the structure that they're operating in, if they're, you know, a sole proprietor, if they're a corporation, if they're a partnership, what does that look like? What what kind of expenses can I really take? You know, if you if you're proactive and really implement some of those planning at the early part of when you start a business, I think that's extremely helpful. You know, there's a lot of things that, that small business owners can do. Uh, you know, I think if you're if you're selling a business, you definitely need to work with a tax professional and see how you want to structure the sale. You know, if if you believe that you're going to have a, a big estate for your heirs, you definitely want to think about tax planning and how you want to structure that. So, it just, you know, kind of different phases of your business life and of your personal life in general. What's going on? You really need to be thinking about taxes and what's the best way to minimize the tax burden. Deborah, tell me a little bit about the type of client that you typically work with and the the types of services that you offer. I know you do represent taxpayers before the U.S. tax court. We represent individuals and businesses before the IRS on domestic and international tax issues really in all phases of the audit, appeals, and collection process. I would say the most common type of case that we see is we'll we'll have a taxpayer who hasn't filed a return in a number of years, and they owe the IRS back taxes. And so they need to, you know, work with us and getting themselves in compliance with the IRS, meaning all the returns need to be filed, need to be making estimated tax payments, Again, if you're 1099, and then you need to get into some sort of resolution strategy with the IRS, you know, whether that's a payment plan or an offer and compromise. That way, you know, they can pay back the back taxes, get the IRS off their back. I mean, what I think a lot of people don't understand is the IRS is the biggest and most aggressive creditor really in the world. And, you know, if you owe the IRS back taxes, you really need to get in some sort of resolution strategy so that you don't have to worry about getting your wages garnished or your bank account levied, and working with a a reputable firm that understand how the IRS works is really the best way to go um, for those types of folks. Deborah and Garrett, Gregory, thank you so much. This is great information. Tell the listeners where they can learn more about you. Uh, Well, thank you so much again for having us. You can uh, reach us at 888-346-5470 or please feel free to visit us online at gregorytaxlaw.com or like us on Facebook. Share Money Girl with a friend or submit a quick five-star review in iTunes. I want to thank some folks who did that recently. Straight Nut says, I love this podcast. It's great to learn new financial tips while working. I would recommend the show to anyone looking to learn more about personal finance issues we face every day. Caitlin M. says, good info presented in an easy to understand and interesting way. Scarlet 10 is says, I got addicted to this show about two years ago when I wanted to increase my financial knowledge and explore investing. I love how it's bite-sized and I can learn great tips and strategies while brushing my teeth taking a short walk, and driving to work. It was also important to have someone empowering me instead of being made to feel bad or guilty about not having all money issues figured out. Yay, Laura Adams. Well, yay, Scarlet 10 is. I want to thank you for being a longtime listener and thank everyone for submitting five-star reviews. It really means a lot to me. And I love how you're incorporating personal development into your daily routine with podcasts. I do the same thing. Believe me, it will make a huge impact on your financial success and happiness. In addition to iTunes, you'll find the show on other audio apps like Stitcher, SoundCloud, and now on Spotify's mobile app. So I'll thank you in advance for subscribing and taking the time to submit a quick review wherever you get the show. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week, courtesy of Money Girl, your guide to a richer life. 